In a world where everything is increasingly becoming digital and virtual, urban digital twins and smart simulations of city development efforts is a potential game changer for urban planning. It has the power to govern cities in an effective manner. Digital twins allow the simulation of plans before implementing them, exposing problems before they become a reality. Research indicates that digital twins for urban planning is to yield $280 billion in cost savings by 2030. Digital twins are forecast to form the essential building blocks of a metaverse, which can help enhance economic development, effective management of human resources, and reduction of ecological footprint to increase the overall quality of life of a citizen in both the physical and virtual world. Let's hear the views from our plenary speakers on Digital Twin and Digital Cities. As we move from the history of GIS to emerging trends in the future of GIS, I invite our panelists to join me on stage. Today we will be joined by Jürgen Dold, Executive Vice President, Hexagon Switzerland, EVR Mohan Reddy, Founder, Chairman, and Board Member of Scient India, and Frank Pauly, CEO, Cyclomedia, the Netherlands. Please join me. So in this session, we'll move to digital cities and in fact, digital twins, and uh, rely on the expertise and the insight of our panelists today to better understand what's ahead, where we're at now, and I think perhaps most importantly, as we discuss digital twins, how do we get there? And so with that, I would in fact, Jürgen, to make some comments and then we will continue on. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Um, I was asked to speak a bit about the metaverse and what does it help us with digital twins. Um, the metaverse is not flat. In fact, it is by definition is anything but flat. Um, the definition of the metaverse is as following. The metaverse is the next evolution of the internet, enhanced and upgraded to consistently deliver 3D content, spatially organized information and experiences, and real-time synchronization communication. True, metaverse is a buzzword. Um, and, however, I be truly believe that will help the adoption of digital twins and so forth. Then the limits and constraints of a world in 2D are well known. We want to be free from limits. The multidimensionality is important to all of us in the room. Whether it's political problems, whether it's geometrical problems, geospatial challenges. I truly remember 25 years ago, companies wondered whether they need a presence in the World Wide Web. And I know how like a geosystems part of Hexagon was those times, 20 years, very proud to have the first website explaining the about us. Um, but still, today, some wonder if 3D and beyond is important. And in my opinion, it's not important. It is critical. And it is the only path forward to save a thriving and a sustainable future. Based on the definition we heard earlier, the internet is evolving into the metaverse. That is not flat, but 3D. And by applying the vast amounts of data we have at our disposal, it will become 4D, 5D, and beyond. Much of the attention around the metaverse to date is centered around on social experiences. That's where metaverse basically comes, where people can meet up. I'm most excited about the potential of smart digital reality, where the goal doesn't have to do anything to do with a social interaction. It is about simulating experiences in the digital world before moving into a physical world. At Hexagon, we are building up one-to-one -one maps of almost everything. We map the world and create 3D digital landscapes. Construction engineers and other add other dimensions to it, such as their BIM models, and then they simulate different what-if scenarios. Communicating, 
communication between trades on a construction sites become much more simple, more experiential, and the involved parties understand better the what-if scenarios in these complex worlds. This creates endless opportunities to be more efficient. We had in the pre-discussion the question, when is it right to start? And, and some may think, when is that get real? I think it's now. I look at digital maturity rather than the digital transformation. Cloud technologies, widespread adoption of artificial intelligence, leveraging digital twins using blockchain and unleashing edge computing, companies and organizations might be at different stages of maturity. But the technology are here and are on the way to get mainstream. We are living in an exciting time when adoption of digital technology is skyrocketing, both at the consumer level, which basically helps to drive adoption, and at the enterprise level. Industries and governments see the huge potential of efficiency gains from connecting real-world systems to the digital world. And we, as geospatial engineers, have a unique opportunity, not as every generation, but we have a unique opportunity to shape digital business processes for decades to come. Disruptive technologies will change the way we work. And the rapid growth of accessibility and affordability of this technology will disrupt how industry gets work done. Digital worlds are getting more affordable than ever, capturing the world around us. Autonomous reality capture with robotic solutions isn't futurit futuristic at dreams anymore. It is here, either attached to robots on the left side, or nowadays flying sensors in the center. And to see, measure and manage these digital realities, platforms such as our Hexagon HXDR platform solution, is seamlessly fusing big data from nearly every sensor platform into a single match. I like to say, if it were easy, then nobody would need us. Some people think the metaverse is too complicated and too esoteric. It's not. Every time you use the word metaverse, just insert the word internet, because they are actually one and the same. How we experience the content in the future, in this new internet, is what is changing. It is more richer, more immersive, more smarter, and our journey has already started. Are there many questions about it, how it will be developed? Of course. But the notion of merging and simulating the real world and the digital world is often running. In fact, there are several industries that are already forging such manufacturing, forging ahead in these metaverses, if you want to say so. It's such as manufacturing cars or airplanes, digital twins, digital design processes, and so forth, a normal way of doing business. In the construction and geospatial industry, digital twins are on the digital, and digital simulation, digital production processes are on the fast track of every company that doesn't want to fall behind. And let me share with you some of the applications for the geospatial industry that focuses on that part of the metaverse where the real world matters, where the physical world matters. Think example for digital nation, made possible here as an example by a nationwide LiDAR coverage, an ambitious pilot project in Germany where we were fortunate to run the pilot project, launched to prepare for a nationwide rollout of a digital twin Germany where every square meter of the country is represented by 40 or more LiDAR points. AI-enabled technology 
provides volumetric biomass to manage the progress of achieving sustainability goals of an entire country. 3D simulations, like in the center here of that slide, of natural hazards such as flooding helps to protect people and infrastructure. And we just learned the last years how flooding can destroy areas in the landscape. Or infrastructure projects, such as for telecommunication or electrical grid networks, can be optimized with such LiDAR data. Think about 5G networks for communication and connectivity. Or think about um, any other wind power f um, plants and so forth. Thinking about 3D models for smart cities, the fusion of aerial views and street views provide unmatched digital views of a city from all perspectives. We call that a super mesh, a joint project between Hexagon and Cyclomedia, and I think Frank will speak about that as well, is something that we basically try to push forward. But it's not only about the experiential and exciting visualization of photorealistic 3D cities and the world around us, but also about the information that lies in every single pixel of such a model. As a human, you can intuitively recognize a house, street or tree. AI algorithms can be trained to do the same today. Thus, we receive quantitative and consistent semantic information of many aspects of the city. For example, the quantitative and honest answer whether the efforts to make a city greener are successful. And the third example, where the metaverse comes together, where the metaverse for the geospatial integrees grows even stronger, is when we have other data that can interact with the digital twin. Architects and governments can communicate urban development plans with the digital twin to all parties involved to add their BIM models into a 3D city model. But exciting are also simulations capabilities for air circulation in combination with the related urban developments that provide another critical information for cooler cities and more sustainable developments of our urban spaces. And connecting the real-time events in the physical space with digital twins for public safety is another step to create smart and safer digital cities. That's where the metaverse, where the physical space matters. Well, coming to an end, as I said, the metaverse is not flat. It is multidimensional. And when I meet you there, maybe we will sit at a virtual cafe and have a virtual glass of champagne and toast of our real world successes. See you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jurgen. Lots to think about there. I would now invite up to the, the podium BBR Mohan Reddy and share his comments. My fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good afternoon to uh, all of you. At the outset, let me um, congratulate um, GWF for um, choosing the theme for the conference as um, Geography and Humanity because of its um, relevance uh, in the times that we live. Equally importantly, choosing uh, the topic for this session as uh, digital twins and uh, digital uh, cities. If you look at um, the concept of digital twins, it's not something which is very new. It's been on for at least last um, two to three decades. Companies like um, ours, have been doing digital twins for aerospace. 
We have um, aircraft engine health monitoring systems. We do, uh, in case of um, healthcare itself, critical patient health monitoring systems. These are all digital twins that have been created from an aircraft engine or from a human system or precisely the patient uh, who is on the care bed at that point of time. So also in case of uh, large plants, their process plants, power plants, mining and so on and so forth. So this technology is not something which is absolutely new, but there are a fairly large number of ch changes we'll talk about. But more importantly, when it comes to digital cities, the challenge is a lot more complex. What I talked about examples so far, what is it to do with a product? It is to do with uh, a solution of a subsystem, or it's a solution for a particular uh, uh, company. But then, when it comes to digital cities, the problem becomes extremely complex because it has many systems. It's just not one, it, the complexity. It has many stakeholders, many technologies. So therefore, it's an extremely complex challenge compared to what we saw as digital twins so far. But here is the biggest benefit, I believe, is with digital cities. So far, if you look at a product, it could be an individual, it could be a group of people, uh, it could be a company. Whereas when it comes to digital cities, what we see, the beneficiaries are going to be the society. So it has a fairly strong societal implications. So what is making this true? I will sp split my presentation in two parts. The first one, I'll talk a little bit about technology and thereafter into applications. It's primarily the pace at which technology is moving. It's exponential is what people call it. I'll just call out one technology, which is uh, Internet of Things, IoT devices they're called. Or in much more simpler language is nothing more than sensors. And these, at one point of time, were very ugly-looking, large devices, expensive. Um, 3D LiDAR um, sensor was more in the range of about $20,000 about 20 years back. What's happened with the sensors is technology has been so overwhelming that three things happened to it. The size got reduced, the cost came down, and equally important, they're becoming more smarter and smarter. Jorgen gave an example about smart flying sensors. So there are many more examples of that nature. So the end result is because of these sensors, there is enormity in terms of data that's being collected, which was fairly expensive in the past, whereas now it's much cheaper. But it's just not the data that's important. It also depends upon the quality of data that comes in. So therefore, there are challenges in terms of how do you collect the data, what frequency with which you collect the data, how much of data then gets transmitted, where does it get transmitted, and thereafter, how does it get processed. But then there are solutions at this point of time, whether it's just not the sensor, but move further on, whether you, you get the data stored at a local controller, or you process it on the edge, or on the fog, and finally on the cloud. So all these options are available at this point of time in terms of processing the uh, data as such. So one clear pointer for us in terms of seeing the enormous amount of change in digital cities enormous amount of progress in digital cities is all to do with the sensors. The second one, if you look at uh, what more is happening in this world, is along with the sensors, you, have, you require computing power, you require storage, and equally important is the communication capability. 
It's a confluence of these four things which are going together. Computers, communications, data, and finally, the algorithms. And these are, br are bringing about a profound change. So if you connect the dots in terms of various technologies, starting off um, intelligent networks and connectivity, and then thereafter apply the algorithms. And again, if you look at algorithms today, the key thing about it is that given the computing power that you have, you could write complex algorithms which can still fly by a few fractions of a second. Or you look at connectivity. In case of 5G, the latency right now is less than a millisecond. People talk about teleconsulting, telemedicine, but you now can perform telesurgeries because of the type of connectivity that you have. As a doctor moves the stylus on a digital body of uh, a human being in his office, it's instantaneously the knife is moving on the body of the patient thousands of miles apart. So the second one, which I think is influencing the creation of digital twins, is all about the confluence of these technologies of connecting the dots, whether it's IoT, it's AI, it's blockchain, it's big data, and several more, which then moves into creating a geospatial infrastructure. Our belief is people um, in technology front, it doesn't seem to be stopping here the growth will continue to be at the same pace, if not faster than what it is. So there's more amount of good news that is there, and we think that the capability, um, Jorgen again talked about metaverse so intensely. Metaverse is to us a confluence between a combination of AR, VR systems together. And they are possible, and they can be executed so well primarily because you are in a position to get the speeds and account of tetronic shifts in terms of computing power. It's not anymore electronics, it's photonics, which will probably drive that computing power. So we'll also see things like, you know, cost coming down much more dramatically from um, a cost of um, classifying, one billion images fell from $1,000 to 13 cents in two years. That's between 2017 to 19. So what makes me believe that digital cities is reality at this point of time is the ability of technology to definitely master the challenges that we have. Let me move on to then talk a little bit about the applications. If you look at um, a city, the very traditional applications was to do with water, sewer, uh, rainwater drain system, power utilities, telecom utilities, and several more. And people created these databases which were layer by layer um, to start within 2D, thereafter they uh, moved into a 3D model as such. But today I think the ability to create more complex databases makes people to address a lot more complex challenges compared to what have been done so far. I'm sure there's a famous um, uh, city in uh, South Korea called Incheon, which has got uh, a complete digital city at this point of time, which is built on five, six pillars. One is on the fire response, the second is on traffic, third is on um, ur urban sanitization, the fourth is on facilities management, the fifth is urban development, and finally, city revitalization. So the, now, with the technology, the way in which the digital cities is moving is getting down to more complex applications. In the first phase of it, it was building digital models. Thereafter, it was monitoring data, monitoring information. Thereafter, acting on the information that you had with you to make sure that some of them were proactive decisions. But what we see now happening with these complex models and the capability in terms of technology is that you can simulate situations far ahead of time. So what are we looking further in terms of uh, 
the digital uh, cities is there are more compelling applications that will come in. It's just not visualization and virtualization, but it will be online, instantaneous, real-time decision-making. Those are the applications that will come in. For instance, the environmental and public safety issues can be modeled, can be, um, uh, can, can be simulated, and then decisions can be arrived. Again, in case of um, smart cities or digital cities, we think that there's a lot more story to uh, unfold than what we have today. Um, again, I, th I thought um, in the earlier lecture, we heard all about the evolution of GIS, how vector drawings were being created, how 2D maps and 3D maps got created. Now we are trying to get rid of the paper part and get into a model where we are creating the globe itself in uh, 3D. So there were at instances where we created all the road networks using uh, paper maps. They were raster, got into digital, and they got a little more smarter thereafter using um, mobile mapping and so on and so forth. What do we see in future is primarily self-healing road networks. You road network information, let, that'll be automated because primarily what we're seeing is that you have autonomous driverless cars that are going around. You send those cars all around. They collect the data. And the data then goes automatically to populate the databases that are already created. That's how it becomes very self-healing in nature. So our belief is by 2040, there'll be as much as 80% of vehicles in the streets of the United States will be autonomous, whether they're owned, um, shared, either the two options that will be there still. But in that particular case, you can understand that you know how much amount of data accuracy that's required to make these vehicles much more smarter. To sum up what I said so far is um, we've seen that there is the digital cities are driving productivity. They are um, definitely enormous amount of cost reduction because of the efficiency that we're seeing. There is um, improved um, understanding of the physical assets. Again, making sure that the productivity goes up. And our ability to simulate scenarios to predict outcomes with great amount of um, certainty is making sure that we are saving a lot of life. The sum total is that what digital cities are making difference to humanity is that it is improving the life of people. It wouldn't be uh, proper if I stepped out before I just said a word about uh, my company. Primarily, we work in technology. We are committed in designing uh, tomorrow together with our stakeholders and being culturally inclusive and socially responsible and environmentally sustainable organization. So our contribution, for instance, is the first company which indigenously developed a narrowband IoT chip on a, a narrowband SOC uh, for improved uh, connectivity solutions, uh, partnering with one of the best education institutions. We do dabble around quite a bit in technology, and final belief is technology should come and help the mankind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mavan. <clears throat> and with that, our final speaker, Frank Pauly, I invite you to share your comments. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to have the opportunity uh, to, uh, to speak at this, uh, this panel on, on a very important uh, topic. And I was asked to, uh, to build on what has, explained, what has been explained in the previous presentations, both in terms of uh, the definition of digital twins, the technology uh, behind it, and to, to interpret that a little bit in the context of, uh, of the Dutch reality, uh, and to give you some further examples on, uh, on use cases, which, uh, which I'm happy to do, of course.
Can I have the next slide? Yes. Um, in terms of uh, interpreting this in, in the context of, uh, of the Netherlands, right, in particular for our foreign uh, guests, it's always, uh, it's always good to emphasize the, the importance of, uh, of accurate geospatial data um, and, and why that is in, in a country like the Netherlands. And in the end, it's, it's relatively simple, right? This is a, this is a small country, so, uh, so space comes as a, at a premium and, and planning space is an important uh, priority. Um, in particular right now, as in the Netherlands, um, next to challenges that are around everywhere in the world, right, in terms of sustainability, in terms of mobility, in terms of the economy and inflation, there is a significant challenge in this country in terms of uh, the fact that there's not, not sufficient housing available, both now as well as in the future. And in, a, in our new government, in that context, um, a new ministry has been created, which is responsible for both spatial planning as well as housing. And that's a very relevant um, conclusion when, when we talk about the importance of, uh, of digital twins. Um, and, and our government has decided that that kind of data, that kind of platform, that kind of architecture, both um, is important uh, at different levels in the government and that our government is committed to, uh, to migrate from 2D to, uh, to 3D and that that kind of data should not only what we've been doing in the geospatial industry to a large extent, right, recording the present, recording the future, uh, recording the past, but that we should be become much more predict predictive and I think that's, um, that's very important in that context as well. Um, when we get to use cases of digital cities, I always like to emphasize, um, when you argue that from a business perspective, that there is no single use case, there is no killer use case that drives the adoption of, um, of digital twins, in our, in our opinion, right? Cities, um, digital twins in the context of, uh, of cities uh, in particular, um, are very important, cities are getting more important, cities are getting more complex, and there is, there is a large uh, number of use cases that are relevant. So when we talk about digital twins from a business perspective, in our opinion, it is important to, um, to recognize a number of use cases, and some of them on this chart on the left-hand side are more on the public side of things, and on the right-hand side are more on the corporate side of things. And we believe it's very important, therefore, that governments cooperate, that governments cooperate with industries and with the geospatial world in order to make digital cities um, a reality. Um, so given those two notices, right, on multiple use cases as well as the, the need for that in the, in the Netherlands, uh, that's something that's important for us as a, as a business, as our core product is about accurate street level data. Uh, we've been doing that for, for many, many years here in the Netherlands. We capture the entire road network in the Netherlands, which is around 170,000 kilometers every year. Uh, we've been doing this is the, uh, the 12th year that we're doing that. So without going into the definition on what is a digital twin and what is not a digital twin, I would argue that, that quite a bit of that content, content we have been making available to our clients, both in terms of imagery as well as in terms of point clouds. And when we capture data, we also uh, host the historical data for our customers, right? So our customers can also look at that fourth dimension in terms of noting, managing, recording change between the different generations of data. And then this year, we're adding an important data set to that. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak at this event uh, last year in October, and there we were announcing that we are now rolling out a complete 3D model uh, of, uh, of the Netherlands. At that point in time, it was an announcement. By now, it is reality. So an aerial mesh covering the entire 40,000 kilometers of the Netherlands we are rolling out as we, as we speak. We have published the first data and we want that to be, we plan that to be completed by the end of 2022 based on uh, recent aerial data that we have captured during 2022. Uh, we see a clear uh, demand for that, we see a clear need for that, um, and elaborating on some of the use cases, um, I'm happy to do. From our perspective, uh, when we launch our 3D products, that is not necessarily a replacement of use cases that we have been supporting. 
uh, as we believe that quite a few of these use cases are supported in a proper way with accurate uh, 2D uh, or 360-degree imagery. Uh, so we look in particular at, uh, at new use cases. And here you see an example on what we're able to do with a, with a large-scale 3D model, right? Allowing us to, uh, to do line of sight and view shed analysis, which is important when it comes to housing construction. And I've emphasized why that is important. And when you talk about um, new infrastructure being designed and rolled out. Another... Um, Important opportunity that we see in the context of, uh, of digital twins, of, of 3D data, is, um, is the whole notion of, of participation of citizens, which is very important, uh, right? So in modern societies, in more complex worlds, governments have an obligation to, to interact, to, to communicate with their citizens, to make sure that whatever is, is decided and designed is done in, um, in a transparent manner. Um, and Average citizens are not necessarily the best people in, in terms of understanding uh, geospatial data layers, right? Or even in terms of reading 2D maps. So the, the whole notion of, uh, of 3D um, allowing individual citizens to, to interact with their government and their environment, we believe, is, uh, is very important. And that these kind of simple simulations will make discussions between governments and citizens much more important. Uh, here you see, if it runs, yes it does, um, a small sample of that nationwide 3D aerial mesh um, <coughs> that we are rolling out uh, as we speak um, and sharing with all our customers in the Netherlands. Uh, we're adding a new dimension to that because our current rollout of 3D data is from an aerial perspective only. Uh, having a strong history uh, from a street perspective, we obviously want to add that reality. And that's what we call the, uh, the Super Mesh, which is a, a joint project between Hexagon and ourselves, where we are fully integrating both the aerial as well as the terrestrial data into what we call the Super Mesh, um, which will again unlock uh, new use cases. And they're a very relevant use case, in our opinion, is something which is called the Omgevingswet in the Netherlands, which is, um, which is a significant legislative structure around the environment, uh, guiding on how the government interacts with its citizens from a location perspective. And there again, we would argue that when government does that kind of planning based on that legislative set, and when there is a need for interaction, a a uh, very detailed um, super mesh will be very important. So we're very excited by the technology because we believe it's, it's the next step on the road to, to making the digital twin promise a reality. Uh, and we will be starting to, uh, to use this in projects later this year. As a matter of fact, we are using it already in, uh, in one project, uh, which we do together with the city of Nijmegen. Um, here in the Netherlands, there are some, um, some interesting habits, right? When it gets winter, when there's a lot of ice, there is, a, there is a competition where people skate 200 kilometers. That's due to global warming, not always possible anymore this year. But every summer, when it's very warm, there is an event where people walk 200 kilometers. And that attracts hundreds of thousands of people to the city of Nijmegen, which makes it an interesting challenge from an event planning perspective from a crowd management perspective. And we have a running project together with that city of Nijmegen where we use this super mesh that I was describing before in order for the government, in order for the police, in order for the organization to properly plan the event. And here you see a small example of that super mesh that is being used in Nijmegen already for that particular use case that I described before. Rounding off, um, I'd like to, uh, to reinforce what I said before, that a super mesh uh, is very much based on a large number of, uh, of use cases, right? That drives uh, the technology, that drives the business model, uh, but I would also argue that drives how that content is being made available to, to the, um, the users of that content. So having all of that data stored together, having all of the data unlocked through a viewer through an intuitive piece of software allowing the users to make use of the data we believe is very important which we also believe is an important 
task for us as an industry to, uh, to facilitate, and we're very open to, uh, to partner on that one. Which concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. I think that the thing to do here is to conclude this session, continue the conversation over this week, and I look forward to many, many more success stories around digital cities, digital twins. So please join me in thanking our panelists today.